Dumpsters. It's late night with David Letterman. Tonight, actor Jeff Goldblum, Paul Schaefer, and the world's most dangerous fan. And now, the highest paid player in NHL history, Dave. Welcome to the program. Thanks for dialing us up. Earlier tonight, right here on NBC, vice presidential, I'm sorry, presidential hopeful Ross Perot. Why do I think of him as more of a vice president? <laughs> Presidential hopeful Ross Perot had his own half-hour television program right here on NBC at 10.30. Let me tell you something. I'm no political expert, but believe me, it takes more than having your own show on NBC to impress people. <laughs> I know that from a long, long... No, no. Did you see the uh, presidential debates last night? I'll tell you. The question I have about the presidential debates last night, why was Admiral Stockdale wandering around on stage? <laughs> Do you ever, let, let me ask you a question. Do you ever think about your life and you kind of reflect on things that have happened, uh, situations transpiring, and, and you, you wonder to yourself, how would my life be different if certain things haven't happened, certain things didn't happen for me? And I was doing a little of that uh, reflection last night and it occurred to me, what would have happened to me in my life? How would have I been different if I never had discovered karaoke? And I think it's <laughs> unbelievable, completely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight is our 17th, 1700th show, right here on... When we started on the air about 11 years ago, New York City was an overcrowded morass of crime, garbage, and corruption. And now, like I say, nearly 11 years later, I think I speak for almost everyone here when I say, it's still the finest morass of crime, garbage, and corruption in the whole damn world. On the uh, program, Bonnie. Thank you, Dave. I want to just say a quick hello to yeah, our good friend yeah. Bobby Womack out in L.A., who's having a monstrous tribute tonight and tomorrow night at the Strand Club in Redondo for the great Eddie Kendricks, former lead singer of The Temptations. Good luck, Bobby Womack, with that. That's very nice of you, Paul. I had a good time out there. This by now, I mean, it'll have been on the air by the time you see this. Paul and I earlier tonight were part of the huge Bob Dylan tribute down there at Madison Square Garden. You were killed in that. Thank you very much. And what a great choice of song. I originally, as you know, I originally was only going to do All Along the Watchtower. And you were, you were going to do it acoustically only. Yeah, and then I decided, what the hell, I'm doing Tambourine Man. Yeah, and that was, <laughs> that was a great choice. Did you happen to see, uh, this is interesting, I was watching the, that unbelievable baseball game the other night on CBS. The Atlanta Braves come from behind in the bottom of the ninth to win, yeah, it was an amazing game. They won the National League pennant for the second year in the row, uh, defeating the Pittsburgh Pirates, what was it, like uh, uh, three, to, three to two. Yeah. A phenomenal game. And then afterward, of course, they had the uh, presentation of the National League trophy to uh, Ted Turner, who owns, of course, the Atlanta Braves. Now, I was watching this, and something very odd kind of occurred, and I was wondering if other people noticed this as well. Now, what you have to keep in mind here, this is a very emotional time for Ted Turner. Brian, if we have a clip of that moment after the ball game, keep your eye on Ted Turner. Now, he, he uh, okay, I believe he's receiving the National League. Okay, now listen to the presentation. To win it the way we want it at All right, the end. he's the president of the Braves. Turner the Braves is season. in the back. Hopefully it's not over yet. Okay, and that's... The fellow who put this machine together, <laughs> John Sherr holds the general manager. Okay, now he's being sprayed with champagne. Together, now listen. John Sherr holds the general manager. Hey, Tim, here's a guy who put this machine together. John Sherr holds the general manager. Hey, Tim, here's a guy who put this machine together. John Sherr holds the general manager. Hey, Tim, here's a guy who put this machine together. John Sherr holds the general manager. Hey, Tim, here's a guy who put this machine together. That's all. He's being sprayed with the champagne.
I, I know there can be few more emotional moments uh, than that, and he's being doused with the champagne, but yeah! I mean, didn't he put you in the mind of an aging kitty? Yeah. All right, Ted. Yeah. <laughs> I'd do the same thing. Uh, let's do our viewer mail. Is that what we're up to? Yeah, let's do some viewer mail and then get on with the big program. Uh, these are actual letters, kids, that come in from actual viewers. Here we go. We've done this uh, every Friday night for the last 11 years. How do we uh, celebrate after doing a really, really great show? Just wondering, Judy Hess, Piedmont, California. The question again, dear Dave, how do you celebrate after doing a really, really great show? This is from uh, Judy Hess, Piedmont, California. Uh, you know what we do, Judy? We, uh, we, when we do a really great show, I take the entire staff over to a little restaurant over on the Upper West Side. It's called Lewis and Clark's, and we, we just go nuts. We just celebrate all night long, and we have a great time. Ah, uh, excuse wonderful. me, Dave. Uh, Lewis and Clark's, yes. Uh, Lewis and Clark's has not been open since 1982. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, dear Dave, last weekend I attended a football game in which our team defeated Ball State, your alma mater. I attended Ball State University. Oh, of course you did. Not you only know. attended, I proudly have a degree from that institution. You probably have. I said proudly. Oh, proudly hold a degree. Oh, I said I probably have a degree. No. <laughs> It's like an, it sounds, sounds like an audition at Hanna-Barbera, doesn't it? Uh, let's see. Uh, anyway, the, the question uh, in which our team defeated Ball State, your alma mater, of course, 62 to 10. After watching this, it was apparent that Ball State could use some help, and I figured you'd want to take a hands-on approach with the team. A concerned viewer, Aaron Rosenthal. Uh, Aaron, Aaron, what are you, nuts? Of course, I'd love to help the uh, Ball State football team. Uh, I, I, however, my coaching uh, talents are already spoken for. Here, take a look at me coaching in action. Brian, roll that clip, will you? Here we go. Let's see what you're thinking. Go, Tom, go. Don't read the labels. Just fill the cart. Go for the expensive stuff, damn it. The meat, the coffee. Meat, meat, meat. Coffee, coffee. Finally, some damn meat. Supermarket Sweep. Good for you. Where can we see more of that show? I have no idea. Ah. <laughs> letter number, letter number, no, you can see it, Paul, if you're really interested, you can see that on the uh, Lifetime Network. Let me mark that down. <laughs> Lifetime. So Ted Turner says to his wife, Jane Fonda, in the afternoon, uh, yeah. you know, honey, we win this ball game tonight when I accept the trophy, I'm gonna act like a kitty. Uh -huh. <laughs> And, and Jane says, Ted, Ted, are you sure, Ted? Do you think that's a... Yeah, I'm going to act like a kitty. You just watch. You just sit back up there in the hotel suite and watch me act like a... Like a... I'll be acting up like a kitty, Jane. You watch that. You did. Keep your eyes on me, Jane. I'm a kitty tonight. <laughs> uh, dear Dave, uh, letter number three begins, uh, why does Paul always have his uh, hand on his chest? One of your fans, Chris Dunn, uh, Bellevue, Washington. Ah, you know, I have noticed that, Paul. Occasionally, it seems like you got your hand, are you covering something? What is there on your chest there? Well, it's, it's a little embarrassing. Let me see that, Paul. What is that? See it? Yeah, no, I can't. Right. Oh, oh my gosh, Paul. Paul, you're an adulterer? No, uh, actually, Dave, I'm an Anglophile. <laughs> See, I love the Queen, and, and I love scones, and I love warm beer and bad teeth, and I like saying lift instead of elevator, and, you know, I know it's wrong, but I, I, I love steering wheels on the right side, and I, I, I love ma Masterpiece Theater. <laughs> you can see Supermarket Sweep on the Lifetime Cable. <laughs> Runs pretty much eight hours a day. Wait a minute. Hey, Paul! Hey, Paul, what about that Fergie? I don't actually care much for Fergie. Okay. <laughs> Letter number four. Dear Dave, what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen on TV? I mean, aside from Ted Turner's kitty impression? 
Uh, now, this is a serious question. This comes to us from uh, Jim Linehan, Cambridge, Massachusetts. A couple of nights ago, I was watching. I was here in the, uh, at the network. We were working late, as we do most nights, putting this fine program together for you folks at home. And uh, I happened to be dialing around, and I got the, we get what this is. Uh, it's like a closed-circuit feed. Uh, NBC News offers it, and you can see it's not, it's not stuff that goes out on the air, but it's stuff from the site. And this was coming in from the location of the debate in Atlanta. And I saw this. It was unbelievable. I called some of our technicians. And I said, boys, can you tape record this for me? Roll that, Brian. I think this is pretty strange. Here, okay, there's Tom Brokaw. He's at the site in Atlanta. All right, now watch. Watch. Look at that. He's, that's right, he's, sure. He's frying bacon at the debates. Can't believe it. Well, there, there's an old expression. I guess I'm telling my own age here now. We're using an expression that goes way back like that. Frying bacon. Frying bacon at the, at the debates. Yeah, my, my, that's my folks used to say that. You're dating yourself. Boy, he's frying bacon at the yeah, debates, well, ain't he? That's Ah, uh, we have to pause now. We're going to do a commercial. Oh. It's my imaginary life for Ted and Jim. Yeah, imaginary action. Oh, uh, let's see. Jeff Goldblum is here. All right, now you've gone and, you've gone and ruined our fun, for God's sake. Uh, the category from the home office in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Top ten signs our nation's infrastructure may be crumbling. Infrastructure. You have your interstate highways, you have your uh, public buildings, monuments, bridges, tunnels, trestles, that kind of thing. Those are, that's the infrastructure? I believe so. I'm not a completely 100% sure on that, but I believe those are some of the infrastructure. And these are the signs. Top 10 signs now that our nation's infrastructure is crumbling. Crumble. Here we go, number 10. Grand Canyon, now only 8 feet wide. <laughs> number 9. Trains must perform Evil Knievel style jumps to compensate for missing bridges. <laughs> Uh, number eight, face of Hoover Dam is a crazy quilt of different kinds of string and tape. <laughs> number seven, introduction of new Ben and Jerry's flavor, nutty crumbled infrastructure. <laughs> number six, New York City potholes now available as studio apartments. <laughs> uh, number five, Tom Brokaw is forced to fry bacon with his eyes. That's a, I'll tell you something, that's a sure sign something is wrong. <laughs> When a, when a network anchor man has, has to, to fry, fry bacon, bacon with, with his, his x-ray vision, you're not telling me something's out of whack? Uh, number four, New York Public Library recently collapsed when Guy leaned against it. Number three, when driving on I-95, often find yourself in center of Earth. Number two, hairline cracks beginning to appear in Barbara Bush. Number one. But at least it's not me making that kitty sound. <laughs> and the number one sign your nation's infrastructure is crumbling. Three words, West Side Highway. There you go. Some kind of toxic nuclear cloud. <laughs> Our first guest, nice to see you. Nice to see you. <clears throat> you know what? This uh, reminds me of last night. We were lucky enough on the program to have Johnny Cash with us. Yes. And he dressed He dressed almost identically. Yes. Now, is, is there a connection? Is this something you thought about? Or is there anything behind the way you look tonight? Or shall I just go on? Uh, no, it's a rich subject. Rich, rich, I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't know what to say about well, it. It's a striking look, certainly. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, striking in a good, good way? Or? Yeah, I think so, because uh, we were all very excited last night when Johnny Johnny Cash was here, and there's just something about his voice yes. and his music and his presence, and it was uh, it was really great fun to have him here last night, and I think that's why I, I noticed this. Well, I, I'm, thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, a couple of interesting things come to mind for me. I know that you were, had the misfortune to be in Hawaii for the most recent storm. Yes, in, yes. In Iniki? Uh, the storm in Iniki, that's right, on Kauai. Um, I, I was filming this... Um, uh, Jurassic Park movie, Steven Spielberg was uh, This is a huge it. motion picture, isn't it? Huge, huge what, motion picture. What is about, it about? Uh, and then we'll get to the storm in a second. Yes, yes. Oh, dinosaurs, you know, um, a billionaire, uh, squillionaire Sir Richard Attenborough, played by Sir Richard Attenborough, uh, gets scientists to figure out with the DNA somehow how to make dinosaurs uh -huh. in the modern world. Makes a park 
out of them. They, and, they start uh, out as a novelty, as just kind of a little something fun, right? The, the dinosaurs? Well, yes, it's meant to be a whole yeah. of big, big fun park. Yeah. Like a, a, a zoo, amusement park uh, thing that people will flock to because they've got hundreds of big, big Actual dinosaurs. dinosaurs, yeah. That, that, that's right. Uh, there seem to be maybe <laughs> safety questions, so they invite me and Laura Darn and Sam Neal to see, take a preliminary tour. Do some troubleshooting? Uh, yes, that, uh, so to speak. And. Uh, Things go haywire. Dinosaurs get out and yeah. run after us. Yes, sir. When DNA experiments go haywire, woo, get a cab. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're there filming the next Steven Spielberg blockbuster, and okay, now what happens? Did you have any warning that the storm was coming? Y yes. Y oh, oh, very little. I, uh -huh. I, it was my last day. <laughs> it was my last day. To be my last day, I was expecting to have it off. Uh, I stayed up late. They call it 6 in the morning. Quick, the hurricane that we thought we talked about yesterday is act is coming. Mm -hmm. If you quickly pack in a half an hour, uh, you can make the last plane out of here. Very dramatic, very exciting. Very dramatic and exciting. I, I put uh, I threw all my clothes from the two-week stay in there. You quickly, you know, bellhops, of course, I and mean, they quickly uh, sort of, you know, lugged it past uh, the women who sold the Danish and all that stuff, and, and looked, <laughs> I'm sure, to them uh, like a chicken, like some kind of panicking. They didn't realize that I was late for this plane. All right, now, now I, I don't want to leave people with the impression that you are leaving the women selling the Danish behind. <laughs> We don't? <laughs> no, no. There on the storm uh, where the island is about to be terrorized by the storm. True. Yeah. True. So, uh, I don't know how we can say about it. But, um... <laughs> Because, anyway, in fact, I was leaving. Yeah. But I missed the plane. There's no plane to get. In fact, the last plane couldn't get off. And that day, you know, they told us the storm was coming. The eye is coming right over the island. Oh, man. Uh, leave your rooms. Put the couches against the windows, because mm -hmm. they're all going to crash in. Fill the bathtubs with water, uh, because there's going to be no water after this. And let's all meet the film crew, in fact, down in this ballroom, where we think it will probably be OK. If it starts to fill up with water, maybe we'll have to evacuate. But we think we'll... mm -hmm. So we kind of uh, look at the storm coming and, and marvel at its awesome power as and long now, as we Now, can. What, what manifestation, what form did it take? I mean, oh, was gosh. it like just the worst driving, windy rainstorm you've ever been in? Or was it much, much more? I mean, obviously, the damage was much, much more. But what did it look like? Well, uh, amazing. As much as we could, you know, we, we stayed out there till we until we did, couldn't anymore, and the waves started right. to come and get bigger and bigger, and wind, and then we kind of, we had to get in, but we'd peek out and be able to see dry, amazing driving, 150 mile winds. You haven't seen, you've seen it on television. Yeah. It's amazing, the sound, and it's blowing, the trees are, you know, yeah. flying Just uprooted everywhere. the big palm trees. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Did, now, did awesome. they say in this storm, or was it the, the, the one in Florida, that they clocked winds, they think, at nearly at 200 miles an hour? I'm not sure which one. Yeah, uh, and you've one. obviously never seen anything like it. No, yeah. never, never anything like it. And uh, we just huddled together for hours, played charades and played games. And, you know, I thought for a second, you know, is, should I have a plan here that's like, have, have they taken care of everything, or should I have... Well, I shouldn't start hoarding food or something. <laughs> I, did. I wanted to do the heroic thing, you know. And, but it did bring us together. We had a sense of community, and we played games yeah. and, and stuff like that. I, I think the Coast Guard, in one of their little hurricane pamphlets, suggests uh, charades during a hurricane. <laughs> yes. I think they do. We're following that. Uh, <laughs> so. uh, well, I'm, I'm glad uh, you survived. And uh, But, man, what a what a horrible experience for the folks who uh, who lived there and uh, oh, lost oh, their homes and, oh, and oh, more. Dreadful. Yeah. There were people who, who didn't make out very well. Uh, we need to do a commercial. Orbison. Because of the glasses, I think, right? I guess so. I don't know. It looks like Roy Orbison, that's yeah. what. <laughs> well, you're not insulted by that, are you? No, no. Johnny Cash, Roy Orbison. Great, yeah. uh, great man, great music. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, we were looking at your film this afternoon, uh, Fathers and Sons. Yes, sir. And it looked to me like... Uh, and forgive me because I really don't know the terms and maybe it's presumptuous of me to be saying this, but it looked like a real actor's kind of movie. It mm. seemed like there were big, long scenes featuring the strength of the acting. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's a very... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, isn't it? It's very good, as, as, as much as I'm humbly capable of. I, I, yeah, it's a nice little chance, and uh, Paul Monis directed it beautifully, and it's a sweet, lovely story, dramatic, you know, about me and my It's very son. sad, isn't it? Well, there are moments of lightness, but it's uh, sad, and finally hopeful and uh, joyful, sweet movie. You know, mostly it centers around this kid who plays my son, Rory Cochran, who uh, looks like me, and people say, 
we could be actual mm -hmm. father and son. And he's going, he's 16, and he's going through, you know, uh, sex for the first time right. and uh, drugs and kind of finding his uh, separate uh, from me and uh, I'm going through a kind of torment myself and trying to figure out how to make a you know express my love mm -hmm. to him and make a connection with him now I didn't see the entire film but it's you and your son and it's not one of those deals where there's some experiment goes wrong in the basement and the kid gets to be like 40 feet tall it's a DNA uh, <laughs> oh, another, another yeah. wacky DNA yeah, it's movie. Horrible, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the, the film goes uh, nationwide soon yes uh, November 6th in New York and Seattle and Los Angeles mm -hmm. And, and then when will the, the Spielberg dinosaur thing be out? That's, that's going to be like probably a Christmas from a year from now? Or I think the summer. I think the they're summer. planning on the summer, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, we mentioned earlier, do you happen to play the piano? Yes, I do. Oh, Paul, do you hear that? He plays the I piano. I understand he hears it, yeah. Uh, I'm shaking. Have you, played, have you played all your life? Oh, yes, since I was a boy. That's right. Yeah, you played professionally as a young man? I, you know, around 15, I, I would get um, secretly, I don't know how I got this idea, I would, I would go to the study and get a, yellow pages and call cocktail lounges around Pittsburgh where I grew up. <laughs> really? And go down the list and call them and say, hey, I understand you need a, uh, a pi piano player. There. Was this part of a Boy Scout project or something? <laughs> it's my own <laughs> wacky idea. And someone said, no, we don't have a piano. And someone said, yeah, well, we have a piano. No, we have a cocktail. No, we have a piano here. Um, I don't know. Come on down and, and show us what you can do. And you I actually got a, got a job. And I got a couple of different jobs. As a 15-year-old piano player in a bar? Yeah. All right. And what would be the, the most requested song? Um, uh, Misty. Okay, I'd love to hear a little of that. Do you mind? Right over there. Paul? Just... Yeah, sure. Misty. Now we're getting somewhere. He's much bigger than you are, Paul. Much larger man than you are. We need some cheap cocktail lighting for this as well, I think. And some cheap cocktails, come to think of it. I have been amused, puzzled, and endlessly entertained by uh, my own dreams. <laughs> but, but what do they mean? Anything? Nothing? Who cares? Who knows? Well, to find out the other day, I paid a visit to an expert in dream analysis, Dr. Sel Letterman, here in New York City. Dr. Letterman, let's start talking about dreams, all right? Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I dream, I'm having this dream that uh, I'm eating a giant marshmallow. You ever hear this? I think it's a fairly common dream. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm going for? No. I have this dream that I'm eating a huge marshmallow, and I wake up, and you know what happens? Go ahead. I go to the pantry, and, and my giant marshmallow is gone. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had anybody do any of these experiments? Uh, I've tried it at my house. You get some uh, cables with some alligator clips, and you hook them up to your head, like you get three alligator clips, one to, to your, well, to each eyelid and one to your tongue, and then you hook them up to the VCR, and you program the timer and all of that sort of thing, and then you can record your dreams. And I've been very successful with that, and have, in fact, rented some to my neighbors. Oh, uh, you've had, you've had X-rated uh, I, 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 I don't know. Now, now you're just being silly. <laughs> I, I, another dream that I've had <clears throat> frequently since I was a, a kid, uh, my, my mom and dad and I are out like in a, in a rough-hewn sort of log structure. It's sort of a, a primitive surrounding. And, and I'm an infant outside, unattended. Mm -hmm. and, and from out of nowhere, a, a giant, huge condor-like carnivorous bird sweeps down and, and hooks his beak underneath my blanket and just in his beak flies me away. And I'm, and I'm screaming like a maniac and this, and this buzzard is just flapping away. It's a, it's, a, it's a horrible experience. There for the longest time I, I had this dream that uh, somebody kept breaking into my house. <laughs> How much would you get for this session? Well, um, my scale is between 150 and 200. Now you're dreaming. <laughs> Some people claim they have dreams that help foretell the future. 
Last night I had a dream about coming here and I dreamed that I'd be out by noon. <laughs> I have a feeling okay. that's coming true. <laughs> Do you ever see the TV show Dallas with that JR? He yeah, was I remember a, him. Yeah, I watched that show faithfully and then after like their ninth or tenth year on the air, Mickey, his, his young arch rival, had been killed in a shower and then the, the very next fall on the very first episode, they announced that everything you had seen the previous year had been a dream. So for me, that did two things. It, <clears throat> it, I didn't want to trust the show Dallas anymore. And also, it gave for me uh, kind of a bad feeling about dreams generally. <laughs> did, did you find that when that happened, your practice doubled? No. Would it help uh, at this stage of our session, or does it ever help in any sessions if, if you and I got down on the carpet and tried to take a nap together? <laughs> take a nap together. Yeah. You ever hypnotize anybody? Yes. Oh, really? I love being hypnotists. When I was uh, married, I went to a marriage counselor. So one day, <clears throat> to, I guess to get me to stop crying, he said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hypnotize you now. Uh -huh. And so I said, okay. And he did. And this was like in 1978. And to this day, whenever the automatic garage door opens, right. I quack like a duck. <laughs> I, like, I like making duck sounds myself. <laughs> Can do that. Oh, geez, Doctor, our time's up. <laughs> like an afternoon with Dr. Floyd, wasn't it? We're done.